the former prisoner and inmate. <laughs> Going straight to the sky, let me see you put your hands up. Cause we do till we die and we on another level. I'm at New York City. Got a piece of the pie, told you once, told you twice, that we only got one life. On the way yeah. to achieve success after prison, he's gonna share his story with us right now. Diamond shine. What's up? <clears throat> Welcome back, Street Beats. Yes, clean shaven. I look like Mr. Clean. <laughs> People were like, why are you looking so young lately? I just shave my face, it's easier, I don't care. Summertime, honestly. Anyway, I have to take my wife's car for some routine maintenance. I got her a new car. She wanted the um, same car that she had, just a newer one. And, you know, and I tried to give her a car that was, I thought was cool, you know, and, uh, it was too big, she didn't like it. She's like, all right, all right I'll find you a, a car like you want. Low miles, until you're newer, but I mean, anyways, she, uh, she loves it. But it has a couple little minor things, including it needs a, um, a drive shaft, which is a funny thing, because it's all wheel drive. So you don't, I'm driving it, you don't actually need the rear wheel. Her car has a drive shaft, which I could swap out if I wanted to, but I'm gonna get a new one. Uh, it, but her rear wheel doesn't drive doesn't work. It's all wheel drive, but like some electrical something fizzled out, and and we just never got it fixed because it drives fine with front wheel drive, and this one will too. But it always drives better in the winter in the snow when you got all wheel drive. So I'm just gonna get it fixed for her, and um, I think it needs uh, uh, what's it called? Swing arm tensioners or something. I fixed those myself in her last car. It's kind of a pain in the butt if you don't like have a lift, but I was able to do it with a friend in about an hour. Um, I'm gonna pay someone to do it this time because it's not worth my trouble. But, anyways, that's where I'm going to uh, get get a, a official diagnostics done. But um, I bought the car yesterday. It's a good car. It's got low miles, real low miles, mint shape. So she's happy. Anyways, so I'll figure while I'm driving, I might as well do a video. And yesterday, what was I telling? A story about my this dude named Travis, bro. You, you're gonna like you're gonna like this story. Man. This is a crazy story man I'm just trying to think where I should begin how I end up with the how I met the dude right the story this 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 episode is gonna be about like okay real recognize real that's it I'm gonna title it real recognize real so if, if you followed me long enough I told a story about how I managed the health club back in the day for a couple of years it was a great gig I made a ton of money it was tons of girls it was a great gig um, so in comes walking one day, I'm just trying to not get off on the side story because there's so many side stories. Um, well, I should go back a little bit, just a little bit. I started, uh, because of that place, I met this dude. This is a funny story too. I gotta make sure I remember this. Real recognize real. Um, my nose is dripping already. So... I, my nose drips because I did Afrin, did some Afrin a little while ago. So my sinus gets pressured up. So one day, I'm managing this health club, and I'll come walking this guy, right? He's a big kind of muscle-bound dude, kind of tall. I won't say gumpy built, but not like real aesthetic, kind of tall and big. Probably like 6'3", you know, 225. Muscular, you know, just long limbs, you know what I'm saying? Big arms. And, um... And I knew he was kind of a square, but he's worked out, and he's always talking loud and acting tough. But I mean, I never really thought he believed he was tough. But so one day, I, all I remember is uh, standing in front of the gym. I think I was talking to a girl. It might have been the, one of the girls I was dating uh, from the gym. And uh, he comes walking out, and he's all pumped up. It's funny. He comes walking out, summertime, sun's blazing, got a tank top on. He's like, man, what's up, man? I feel like nobody can beat my ass, man. I'm telling you, nobody can whoop my ass. And I don't know why I responded, because I was the manager of the club. So I, I wasn't supposed to, you know, act like a hard ass or be a douchebag or nothing, right? But I, guys like that always struck a chord in me. And before I, like, it just bothered me. And so before I realized what I was saying, I said, 
I'll beat your ass in 10 seconds, bro. Flat out. And he, he, he should, you, you could see the wind, like, out of his sails. He, like, he just deflated and he looks at me. He just couldn't believe I said that. I didn't really know the guy well. I just some, some dude at the gym. And, and I, I think he was pretty much playing around, but he's like, man, I feel like nobody can whoop my ass, bro. Nobody can whoop me. And I'm like, I said, bro, you get whooped. I guarantee I'll whoop your ass in 10 seconds. 10 seconds. You won't last 10 seconds. No, no. I said, I guarantee you won't last 10 seconds. He goes, yeah? You think? I'm like, 10 seconds, bro. It's over. You ain't you ain't, you ain't, ain't cut like that. There's guys out there that are freaking monsters. Bro. You get Molly Wong. And he kind of like, <laughs> yeah? And he didn't try to fight it or debate or anything. But you could see in his eyes, like, uh, the understanding. And I think it's from... He was able to look in my eyes. He was able to look in my eyes and just be like, just, just from the look I was getting, like, nah, bro, you ain't cut like that. And he realized, no, I'm not cut like that. Anyways, I became friends with the guy. I won't go into great detail about that story because it's a whole another story for another show. But in a nutshell, I started talking to him, getting a little friendly with him. He worked for an alarm company. He lived with two dudes, there's three of them, all good looking young guys in their 20s, muscle heads. And they all sold weed. So, you know, of course, because I remember saying, do you, you smoke weed? He's like, yeah. yeah. And I said, I, said, I was always looking for new customers. Always trying to find new, good firewood for sale. I'm always trying to find new clientele on the weed. I was never like a huge weed dealer, but you know, anyway, if I could find somebody to buy a pound a week or half pound a week, I mean, it, it adds up. So he says, yeah, I'll buy, you know, I'll buy a quarter pound or whatever it was. And I get over to his house. He's like, yeah, me and my two roommates, we all sell weed. But we all have our own clients, you know. You know, other people come over. We have our own clientele. And, uh, you know, we do our own thing. But we're all kind of doing the same thing. All right, cool. So I start selling the guys weed. They invite me out on their uh, boat. They had a boat. They went, uh, the one dude's name is Damon. Uh, Good-looking guy, muscle-bound, real muscle-bound, good genetics, handsome kid. He was kind of the ringleader of the three. He had a boat. And they took me out uh, water skiing one day, which is a funny story itself. Because I was trying to get up on the, on the on the wakeboard, right? On the, whatever they call it. It's, it's just like the board thing where you're, it's like a water ski, but it's one, it's big. And you gotta stand straight. And anyways, the freaking the boat was pulling so hard because I was such a big guy. It was about 250 pounds at the time, all muscle, just a big old muscle head. Uh, it like was strong, the boat couldn't get me popped up out of water. And it was like, and it's yanking my arms out the socket. And um, it ended up stretching the, any whatever it somehow messed up the spark plug like it like banged the spark plug every time I they tried to get me up and I never did get up and I was mad about that because I knew I was gonna be good at it because I was a good water skier I had water skied in the past and I was a good water skier so I've kept talking trash I'm like dude you guys I'm gonna freaking kill this I'm gonna be fun I hadn't water skied since I was like 12 but but when I was 12 I could do 360s and go sideways and backwards and all kinds of stuff I was a good water skier so I'm like this shouldn't be no problem I just... anyways so the dude worked for an alarm company, and I ended up, I, I kind of soft extorted him into helping me and a little crew uh, start a, a larceny ring, right? And and it started like this. I'm at my grandparents' house, my Uncle Pete Toko, who was a, you know, street guy. A guy who could, who could walk into a room full of mobsters and fit right in, because he grew up with nothing but mobsters, his, his uncles and cousins, and really his cousins weren't, not many of his, none, he had a few of his cousins that were like, would grow up to be made guys and gangsters and whatnot, but most of them were just kind of squares and pussies, you know, um, he knew that, but his uncles and, and a lot of the old men that he grew up around were not, they were like straight cut old school, you know, prohibition era, you know, mobsters, gangsters, and he was around them his whole freaking life. But he went to school with their kids and, you know, grew up with them. And it was a really it was a super tight community. Everybody in the neighborhood knew everybody. It was all, mostly people were related to family or blood or uh, marriage. But my uncle was more of like a, I don't know how to explain him. He never wanted to be a mobster, but he sometimes he acted like one and he, he was one. Uh, I know, he was more of a biker than anything. He, 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 you know, most of the time he'd wear like a jeans and a leather jacket and hung around these biker dudes, right? Outlaw bikers. Um, but sometimes he'd throw a track suit and a gold chain on and like, you know, go, come on, Alonzo, let's go to the market and go see some of his cousins and people in the market, uncles. And he's just, you, you know, you, you would swore he's a made guy. You got, the way he acted, people treated him, how he acted. But, you know, he wasn't really anybody remarkable. Um, just another street guy hustling, street guy. 
And anyways, I'm at my grandparents' house for dinner. We all, the family got together for dinner every week, uh, every Sunday. And I'm there, oh man, that truck is dope ass rims and tires, man, they're about that wide. Um, and he says, we go in the basement to shoot some pool, he's smoking a cigarette, he says, I'll never forget, he goes, so what's up, what's on the floor, what do you got on the floor? Which is his way of saying, you know, how can we make some money? And he was always looking to make money. He was like me, he's a street guy, hustling any way he could. He sold weed, that was like me, his main racket. Uh, I don't know, he might have even been my plug at the time, uh, maybe. But anyways, he says, what's up, what you got on the floor? How can we make a buck, blah, blah, blah. And I thought about this dude, and by the way, the dude's name was Doug. I, I, I keep forgetting the guy's name, which is funny. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the square dude I told, I was like, I was like, nah, I'll beat your ass in 10 seconds, bro. You, you stop acting like that. And uh, his name was Doug. So I thought of him, and I said, I think I might have a, a way in to you know deactivate alarms if you got some guys willing to freaking, you know, go in the houses, hit the safes, you know, and rob the houses. And he's like, yeah, hell yeah, I got guys. So he, he says, set that up. So I go to the freaking, I go to the guy and I pull him aside and I said, hey man, can, can you get in alarms? And I want to get into that whole story, man. I forgot that. It, basically, he helped me. He gave us the alarm sheets. And not only did he give us the alarm sheets, but he showed us how to fry the alarms to cheat the alarms and even gave us the addresses of businesses that were going to be easy to hit and big high-end like mansions and homes that would tell the alarm company we're going to be out of town for the next 10 days on vacation if the alarm goes off it's legit send the cops because a lot of people will forget to hit their alarm and they'll call a minute later and like is it you and you're like, oh sorry i forgot to hit the alarm code boom and then they don't call the cop so he was able to give us those those times and homes and I, I told him he didn't want to do it at first but I told him I said come on bro I'll give you a freaking good cut you know and, and he's like well how much I said you get all the electronics so anything they get like camcorders VCRs TVs cameras anything like that you can take your pick whatever the frick you want take it he's like all right you know and I said I got a pawn shop and my uncle got a pawn shop where you can pawn it for cash so he thinks about it I said, I said bro come on bro and, and I feel kind of bad because I basically made him do it. I, I don't. I feel bad about it because I, I essentially said you have no choice, bro. And I just kind of said I left at it like that. I said, man, bro, listen, it's like you're going to do this one way or another. And I don't even want to say what I said to make him do it to scare him because you'd think I'm a douchebag. But uh, but anyways, so that's what I did. And so this led to this pawn shop swap which i've recorded videos about that in the past to hate drive i'm passing the truck 70 miles an hour feels so fast to me because i'm used to doing like 55 but uh so they started breaking into these houses getting all this uh this freaking douchebag in the past me at 80 two inches away i gotta get over anyways um so we started getting all this merch. The problem was you couldn't sell all this merch in my uncle's pawn shop because it was stolen from like the east side of Detroit. And there was a rash of robberies, I'm sure the cops knew of it. And high-end home businesses are getting hit. So you can't take the merch that you, you're stealing and go sell it in the pawn shop in the neighborhood or where you're from. So you, so the jewelry could be melted down, diamonds popped out, watches and things could be sent off to jewelers. Or, but all this other merch started piling up. So my job in this whole scam racket was to drive the crash car where I, I had a, uh, a, a, what do you call it? A scanner, police scanner. And I would listen to the police scanner to see if anyone called the cops and they're sending cops to that house. It only happened one time. Only one time a neighbor called the cops, said he saw lights flashing around inside the house. And uh, they called the cops. I told my guys in the walk, get up, get up, get up, cops coming. And we took off. If I had to act like, you know, if I had to kind of hem the cops up, I would have. That would have been my job. I drove this old crappy Caprice. But, um, anyways, so my uncle says to me one day, God, it's such a long, crazy story. I'm not going to get into the, the, all the particulars because there's like four different stories attached to this. He says, but listen, I'm going to hook you up with this dude. He's uh, connected to some Chicago mob guys. And they're gonna, you're going to drive down there with him to Chicago 
and give all this merch to them and they're gonna give you a, a van full of uh, merch or it's like a cube van, like a U-Haul type of van uh, truck. He said, and you're gonna take all their merch back here and we're gonna sell their merch in Detroit. So, so stuff that was stolen in Chicago could be sold in Detroit and the stuff that was stolen in Detroit could be sold in Chicago. So it made sense. So he tells me, you know, the kid's name is Tony. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm not gonna say his last name because the dude's out there. Of course, some hater ass trolls will probably freaking dig him up. Go, well, I don't understand. He did this and that. Um, but the, the funny part about that dude is small world. I don't know who the guy is. My uncle says, you know, go to the warehouse, take this van from Artie, a guy named Artie, take the van, load it up. Then this dude, Tony's going to meet you. You're going to go down to Chicago down there. You're going to dump this stuff, spend the night, and you're going to come back the next day with our stuff, with this dude. I'm like, all right, cool, cool. I pull up, I go to meet this freaking dude. It's a dude that I freaking, I beat up. I didn't really beat him up. I just smashed him over the head with a TV while I was on acid. I was tripping on acid one night, and the guy was hitting on my girlfriend. And uh, I warned him. I said, hey, man, it's my girlfriend. Chill out. And he kept hitting on her. And I kept, I warned him like three times. Kept hitting on her. And uh, he wouldn't listen. And uh, so I picked up a TV. And the funny thing about that was it was in a different neighborhood. So it's just me, my best friend, my boy Joey, my girl, and her two friends. But there was a party, not a big party, probably 15, 20 people in the house of this. And we were in a whole different district. This is Lakeview District. I'm from Lakeshore, and uh, you know, the, us, the, all, they knew Lakeview guys knew Lakeshore was a tough guy. So, but they, I don't think they knew me. They, I don't think the dude knew me. Obviously, he didn't know me. The dude having a party knew me though, because he was from my neighborhood and he moved to Lakeview. So I told him, man, you better tell your boy, man, to freaking, you know, step off my girl. And I'm saying, I don't want to have to freaking smash him. So the dude Chris went over to him and said, Hey, man, relax, bro. That dude, hell, that's his girlfriend. You don't want no smoke with that dude. It's freaking a little off there. And he warns the guy, and the guy walks away, but 10 minutes later, he's back over to sitting next door on the couch, you know, run a game on her. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, man. This freaking mother effort. And it's, I'm tripping on acid, and I, like I said, when I'm on acid, like I've only done acid like six or seven times, and only once I didn't get in a fight, and that was because uh, I was with just my homeboys, and we were all on acid. I was uh, the day after I did a bodybuilding show when I was 19 years old, um, and I just, just tripping balls and eating cookies and that's all I cared about but every other time I get paranoid and I feel like people are staring at me or looking at me crazy and I start tripping uh, you know I could, I could do a whole show on just my like acid fights which is tri dude fighting on acid is a trip bro. you know what I'm saying it's so it's weird man it's, you're like in another world and it's like it's, a, it's almost out of body experience but uh so I go to meet this dude and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding. He don't say nothing. He's got his boy. But when I once I meet him, I, I gotta go down to Chicago with this dude, the guy smashed over the head with a TV. I'm like super nervous now. I'm like, man, this guy could try to get me, you know? Like the, the, this could be a play to get back or whatever. So I call my boy Travis. Uh, and I say, would you come down there with me, right? Have my back. He says, bet. Now here's how I bet I, I met Travis. I'm managing this gym. And uh, one day he comes walking in. He's kind of he's a good looking guy, kind of muscle bound, like you think he worked out, but he really didn't. And he's just like, hey man, what's up? I'm looking for a job. I'm like, well, what, what's your deal? He's like, well, believe it or not, I'm a carny. He's like, I'm from like North Carolina or something like that. It could have been anywhere. It could have been Chicago. It could have been New York. I don't know where it was, but he wasn't from Detroit. And he says, um, I've been a carny for the last like you know, nine months and I'm just sick of traveling and uprooting and going with these carnies it sucks it's like I'm just trying to find a freaking job man but I gotta find a place to stay I got a job and I said bro can you help me manage the gym or run the gym he said yeah hell yeah I'm like it doesn't pay much it only pays like freaking nine bucks an hour plus commission on your sales for your gym membership which was good money you know so it's, overall he was probably making 20 bucks an hour but he's like I gotta find a place to stay before the carny go so it just so happened the people who owned the gym owned an apartment complex. And uh, so I said, let me talk to the, the owner. So I went to them and said, hey, this kid's going to help me manage the health club. Can you give him an apartment and then let him uh, like take the money out of his paychecks to pay for the apartment? And she was cool. I think her name was Karen. She was cool. She was like, yeah, you can do that. So I'm like, I went back to the deal. I said, bro, I got you a place to live. I got you freaking uh, 
you know, a job, you're good to go, let's do this. So I ended up starting to hang around with this dude. And uh, he's at the gym every day. I'm at the gym working, you know, I'm managing the gym. So I see him all the time and he's funny guy, he's a cool guy, we got along good. And we just gotta take him out to the club, you know. He's a tough guy, he'll fight in a minute. He was, he was, he was one of those dudes who would get drunk and fight anybody, anytime, any place, wouldn't care about whoever, and he wouldn't hesitate. Like, I hate those barkers and the talkers. That's why I say real, recognize real. This mother effer would not bark or talk or nothing. Like, if you, if you tried if you tried him, he's going to beat your ass. He's just, you know, I never see him knock anybody out, but I see him beat the crap out of a couple guys who got tough with him or loud with him. I'm like, it's just the kind of guy he was. So I'm going to finish this story in a minute because I got to go into the mechanics. Uh, I got to go into uh, figure out where the mechanic is got to find this mechanic but uh and then i'm going to tell you what happened when i went to chicago oh, with this with this dude travis it's crazy trust me it's crazy <laughs> so good news is i don't think i need struts for the car this way iron stabilizers which i can put on myself i've done them already once on my wife's car they are kind of notorious there's a spider crawling on my windshield on the outside it's creepy so um and so they're actually pretty easy to put in. I spoke to this mechanic, nice, honest guy, came outside, showed me how to, to diagnose it without like even putting, yeah, sway arm stabilizers. They're like 25 bucks for a set. I put them on myself, gonna need a torch. I'm not really a mechanic. I'm not, never claimed to be. In fact, I'm terribly not a mechanic, but I'd rather do it myself than pay someone 100 bucks to do it. Like with, if it's something I can do myself in two hours, I just can't see myself, not even two hours. It'll probably take me an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes, hour maybe. If it's something that I can do myself, then I'm not going to pay someone 50 bucks an hour to do it. That's insane. So I'll do it. Um, that's a good thing. And then the drive shaft thing is really cool too because my mechanic said there's no like moving parts. You just pop it in, bolt it down, bang, you're in. You're good to go. He did say might be better off leaving it as is because uh, you probably have better gas mileage in the in the four-wheel drive version of this car. It's like, it's good in the snow, but you know, how often we drive in snow? Anyways, back to this story with this dude, Travis. So, I had to get over. So, I drive this load of merch down with this dude named Tony and his boy, can't remember his name, and I bring my boy, Trav, and I feel like me and Tony both were, were kind of like this mother effer could be, you know, setting me up or we were both like suspects. So we each brought a homeboy with him. Although his boy, I don't, he wasn't a real threat type of mother effer, but I don't think, I care, I had a gun on me, by the way. I did, I brought a gun because you never know. You know, worst case scenario, you, you just don't know, man. You're dealing with criminals and, and, you know, like I beat, I smashed this kid's head in with a, t with a TV, had no idea he was connected to the mob. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that's not even the full, the full, like there's more to the story. People, I, I, I get why people don't believe these stories. I get it. I get it. I see the kid two years after, three years after, about two, three years after I smashed the TV over his head. He's at a party. It's a, it's a, uh, Halloween night party. I'm dressed as Al Capone. I mean, they figure why not? You know, it was like I was in the mob thing. I never did that before, but I needed a, uh, I needed a, a costume. So I said to my grandpa Toko, I said, Grandpa, I'm gonna dress up as a mobster. Uh, can I borrow one of your old zoot suits? He gives me this old fedora and suit. It's perfect. I got and then I look like a pimp. All the girls loved it. But anyways, these two dudes, or it was it was uh, yeah, it was two of them, came to our party. The same dude who was hitting on my girl, who I smashed with the TV came to my neighborhood and ends up at our party that our homeboy was having party was having and uh and then they leave with like one of the girls from our neighborhood was dating one of this this dude tony was dating them, the hottest chick in our neighborhood hottest chick in the neighborhood was dating this freaking dude right and uh so I'm sitting there macking on some other chick i was broken up with my girlfriend at the time so i didn't care i'm hitting i went there I went there with this hot ass chick who dressed up as a Playboy bunny, man. I had this other girl meet me, this black chick who was dressed as Pocahontas meet me there. Some girl from my class, I was in college at the time going to community college. Beautiful black chick, she was a model, beautiful. She comes there, my girlfriend was there. 
and then uh, there was uh, like the hottest chick I ever saw in my life walks in with like some of the girls from my neighborhood. I'm like, who the hell is that? So I'm hitting on her. And then all of a sudden, I, I saw those two dudes from Lakeview there. And I'm like, eh, whatever. No, I don't give a crap. Maybe somebody invited them. I don't know. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm in the front room, and uh, my boy Mickey Walsh comes running in the in the in the. Uh, the living room was just man what's up Al man you know my efforts from Lakeview were talking shit about us blah 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 and I'm in the middle of talking to this beautiful chick that I'm pouring it on like dropping mad game I'm just trying to be smooth who are you I'm like no no I'm Al Capone I mean all dressed in a fedora and like a pimp my girlfriend and all her friends kept walking in the room giving me dirty looks like really Al really I'm like yeah, yeah, we're broken up man I'm gonna hit on everything I see I had girls all over the party were there with me and um also, he says, hey, you guys, Lakeview boys are talking trash about us, right? He says it real loud in front of this hot chick, and I'm just like, yes, what do you want What do you want me to do? I said, you want, you want to beat their ass? She goes, you want to? I'm like, do you want to? He's like, yeah, let's get them. I'm like, All right, I bet. So I said, come on. What made me go out the back door, I don't know, but I ran out the back door instead of the front door, but the girls, my girlfriend and her friends, they heard me say that because they were like eavesdropping on what I was doing, hitting on this hot chick. So they ran out the front door to catch the dude, Tony and his boy. And they run outside, go, look out, Al's coming, man. He's coming to get your ass, da, 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 da. And, but I'm coming out the back door and I walked out the back door. And my boy who had owned the house had a big giant Rottweiler that scared the crap out of me, man. This massive Rottweiler named Zeus. This thing was so scary, bro. And he was barking at me, rah, 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 rah. the thing was huge, man. I'm telling you, like a 200 pound dog. I'm like the whole time trying to walk out the back gate. Then once I got him out of the gate, I was cool. And I come walking up, and the girls were out front telling Tony and his boys, like, go, 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 go. Al's coming, Al's coming. And I didn't even go get none of my boys, nothing. I didn't say, tell the crew in the basement, because I was upstairs. The crew was in the basement. Everybody's in the basement. I didn't go down and say, yo, I'm about to slap around some of them two late Lakeview kids who were just here or nothing. I just said, come on, Mickey, let's do it. Didn't even think to even mention it to anybody. I just said, let's do it. I had a suit on. I'm wearing a suit and a fedora. I'm going to go slap this motherfucker. So the girls were out front saying, you know, gotta beat it, gotta beat it, gotta beat it, because here L's coming, L's coming. And I come walking up out down the driveway and say, hey, you, you mother effers, come here. I said, you guys got something to say about us? No, L, L, we don't got no problem with you, we ain't got no problem with you. I said, you got something to say, man? You say something about us, you talking about? It? No, L, we don't got no problem, man. We don't want no problems, we don't want to fight you. I said, fight? Who said anything about a fight? Ain't nobody gonna be fighting. It's gonna be me beating your ass, mother effer. Oh, come on, L, man, we don't have no problem. And I grabbed their heads. They were standing right next to each other. So my instinct was to grab their heads and go crack. And I cracked their heads, their noggins off each other's heads. It was funny as hell. Bing. I said, come on, let's fight. I said, literally, this is your lucky day. <laughs> I said, you two against me. It's your lucky day. Two on one. You got me. You got this. Let's go. I took my fedora, threw it over to the girls. They didn't want to fight. They're like, well, we don't have a problem. They ran and jumped in the car, and the guy had to back out, couldn't get it. So keep in mind, now fast forward two, three years, whatever it is, and I got to go meet this dude, and I meet him at a restaurant, and we realized, you know, we're the liaisons for the Chicago and Detroit mob, us two little punk-ass kids, and I'm managing all the stolen merch I got in a warehouse, right? So I got to load it up and take it down there with this kid, so it's their, he's part of it. So I take my boy Travis down there, this freaking carny kid. There's a freaking carny. And uh, and we go to uh, down there. And what we do is we dump all the merch off at a at the back of a store, right? It was an electronics store, right? Not like electronics, like cameras and crap, but like lights. Lights and um, TVs. And I don't know. It wasn't. It was mostly lamps and crap. Anyways. So there was a back room. We'd unload all the stuff. It's probably $100,000 worth of merch, right? Fur coats, gold jewelry and watches, a lot of electronics, guns, a bunch of guns. That was the scary part because I was like, man, if we get stopped with all these guns, we're freaking going to jail. But we, we were, it was all under the guise of legitimacy. The truck was rent, was leased legitimately. We were making a run for the pawn shop, doing merch swaps. They, they had it all looking right, like real paperwork and stuff, so it looked legitimate. So if the cop at a first glance would have stopped us, it would all look legit. We're taking a bunch of merchandise to Chicago to sell in a store. Um, it looked authentic. If they would have stopped, started running, like, you know, serial numbers on watches and crap, and, and, and then we might have been in trouble. But, um, but anyways, so we get down there, we dump off the stuff, so the next day, we have to load up a truck the next day 
and, and, and head back to Detroit with a bunch of Chicago merchandise. But we have to spend the night in a hotel. So me and Travis, so, so the dude, Tony, he, he's cool. He's not like, he's not tripping, you know, on the way down. We start talking. We've got a bunch of mutual friends. We know a whole bunch of mutual people. And he's like, I remember the time you did this. I heard about it. And I remember the time you did that. And I'm like, oh, I heard about you and your boys. And I, we got a bunch of mutual friends from, from Lakeview and crap that are like, good dudes, bosses, you know, like solid mother effers, you know what I'm saying? So he starts dropping these names about these solid mother effers that I know. I'm not going to give their names because they're still out there. Some of them might even be active mob guys. And I'm like, oh, dude, if he's tight with these guys, then he's freaking, you know, I guess we got off on the wrong foot. But the thing is, you know, it started with my girl. You had it coming with the TV and then, you know, the, the whole smashing your head together in front of the party. I mean, that's just me being a douchebag, really, but you know how it is. You're in your neighborhood, two rando dudes from another neighborhood, and they're both really good-looking dudes. God, that's a whole other funny story. The guy who was with him was this really good-looking short Italian guy, dark hair. He looked like a young um, Tony Danza, and that was my girlfriend's type. She liked the little short, stocky, good-looking Italian guys, right? Well, it turns out that... The girl, the Tony dude was dating the hottest chick in the neighborhood. Well, she was like one of my girlfriend's best friends. Well, she was trying to hook, she was trying to hook my girlfriend up while we were broken up with the Tony Danza looking mother effort, this handsome kid. And, and I get it out of my girlfriend. My girlfriend like, she, she admits it. I don't even remember how. She's like, yeah, it's, you know, Tammy was trying to hook me up with this kid, da da da. I'm like, what's the kid? She's like, that guy. I'm like, that mother effort? The kid from the party that slapped his head off the freaking, She's like, yeah, and I'm like, she was trying to hook me up, but I don't want, I ain't gonna hook up with her, she loved me, right? I said, if I see this mother effer, man, let me see this mother effer. <laughs> it's so funny, man. So I'm in the mall with my boy Gino and my boy Beast, Jay, Jay Bash, big gigantic monster, huge mother effer with a mohawk, strongest guy I've ever met. Guy's a 400 pounds, six foot two monster who could bench 500 pounds in high school, like five times. You can bench 405 on incline 12 times in high school. Biggest, strongest guy I've ever seen in my life. Just a freaking freak on the strength tip. Even before he did steroids, he was he was benching 500 pounds. So, I mean, dude was a beast. So, I'm with him, but he wasn't tough, though. He wasn't a tough guy. There was a bunch of times that we there was brawls and fights that happened, and this mother ever didn't jump in and do nothing. He's like, I'm not a tough guy. I don't like to fight. You pussy, you don't got to fight, bro. All you got to do is run in there and go, ah! Everybody's going to run, man. You think somebody's going to try to fight a 400-pound, gigantic mother effer with 25-inch arms and a mohawk, bro? You don't got to fight? Just start yelling and throwing mother effers. He said, I don't have the eye of the tiger. That's what he told me. I don't, I don't have the eye of the tiger. I'm not like you. And, you know, I get it. Not everybody's meant to be a... If I, I told him flat out, bro. If I was you, if I would have been you, I would, I would have played 10, 15 years in the NFL. You would have been unstoppable. If you had the eye of the tiger, if you would have had that freaking that mindset, that I'm going to kill everything in front of me mindset, you could have ran through the NFL, bro. Ran through it. You would have been a starting center and a Super Bowl team for 10 years, bro. I mean, you just didn't have it in him. But, you know, whatever. I mean, it's not for everybody. But I. He, but he was with me. So I'm in the mall. I'm with Gino and this dude. I walk through the mall. Hudson's, Marshall Fields. It, it turned into Marshall Field. And uh, I see the little Hollywood pretty boy mother effer that allegedly was trying to hook up with my girl. Or that girl, her friend was trying to hook her up with this dude. So I see this mother effer, man. And, I, and I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I mean, I guess I was a little jealous because he was such a handsome guy. And, you know, plus some guys, they, most of them dudes, man, they like, they, they weren't tough guys. You know, they might have looked kind of tough or even acted. They weren't. And they're all pussies compared to like me and Gino. Like, I still talk to Gino all the time. That's my boy. You know? I mean, literally, FaceTime a, a week ago. But, I mean, that was a tough guy. I Me, mean, I was a tough guy. And we were smashing him up. But this kid, you know, it was almost bullyish for me for what I did. But he was hitting on my girl. And I was, guess I was a little jealous. He was a handsome dude. And he was my girlfriend's type. And she kind of threw it out there to make, to make me jealous. Which girls do. They you know, want to make, it, make their... Boyfriend's jealous. Oh, this guy likes me. He's trying to hook up with me. And I'm like, that mother effer, man. Good looking, studly ass. I'm going to beat that mother effer's ass if I see him. So I see him and I run up on him, bro. And I, I corner him in the middle of Marshall's Field. It's not corner him. But I get him I, right in his face. That's again, I get these, these stories. I get why nobody believes him because it sounds insane. But 
was, was me. I said, what's up, mother effer? You know who I am? I get right in his face. He's got his boy with him. His boy, like, backs away. You don't know what the frick's happening. I said, what? What's I got, I got Gino, who's, like, a legendary tough guy, and myself. So, like, the two toughest guys in the city mob up on him with a giant 400-pound dude with a mohawk. We all, like, corner him. <laughs> so the dude's probably crapping his pants. I mean, I'm sure that he... Yeah, he actually, he didn't know who I was. Yeah, I'm, I'd be shocked if he didn't know Gino. Though. I said, do you know who I am, mother effer? And he goes, uh, uh, Mark Monday? He says, you're Mark Monday? I said, what? Mark Monday was a, another really handsome, stubbly ass dude, but he was my boy. One of my best friends. One of my closest friends. I still talk to him all the time. Awesome dude, great Christian guy, amazing guy, fished with them. I see him taking a fishing Look at his son, salmon fishing. But he was such a handsome dude. Like, I wasn't even in the, remotely in the, I didn't look like him at all, bro. Like, like Mark was a stud, man. Like, he looked like a young Michael J. Fox. That's who he looked like. And so, but he was bigger than Michael J. Fox. The normal size. And so, I said, Mark Monday. And I grabbed the dude. I grabbed him by his face, man. And they're, you know, in the middle of Marshall Field to the mall, or like the stores, the department stores, they have the like a four-sided mirror. It's like a, a pylon with a mirror about yay wide, but it's on all four sides. So if you're trying on clothes, you can walk up and look at the mirror. You know, anyone from all four sides can look at the mirror. That was where he was standing right next to one of them. So I grabbed this mother. I said, Mark Monday, what? I grabbed what a face. I said, what a face. And I smash his head into that mirror so hard that the mirror shatters, bro. Crash it makes a bunch of freaking noise. Everyone in the store is looking. I don't care. I don't care at all. I'm squeezing this mother out of her face. It's so hard with my claw. I got my face and claw in his face. I'm squeezing so hard. My my fingers are like my fingernails are causing them to bleed. I'm digging. Motherfucker, I got face smashed against this thing. Smashing them. I said. Before you hit on a girl, a guy's girl, mother effer, you better know who the eff is, who your boyfriend is. That's what I said. You better know who the effer's freaking boyfriend is. Smash! And I smashed that off the thing again. I didn't tell him my name because I didn't want him telling my name. You know, I'm like, all right, I don't want to catch a case. So I smashed his head off. And I said, man, you better learn who the frick you're hitting on, bro. And of course, in his mind, he probably didn't do nothing. The guy he probably didn't do nothing. He probably said to Tammy, who's that little short brunette with the big boobs? And she's like, oh, that's my friend Ramona. He probably was like, oh, she's cute. And Tammy was like, yeah, she had a boyfriend, but he's a douchebag. And, and that was probably it. And uh, she might have said, his name's Al Lindblom. Do uh, you know who he is? He probably was like, nah, I never heard of him. Why would he? He went to another school from a different, he, he might have, he might have freaking, he, he might have totally went, yeah, I, I heard Al Lindblom. I don't know the guy, but I know of him. But he didn't know what I looked like. He, didn't, he had never seen me, maybe. Because obviously he didn't recognize me when I walked up on him. I said, you know who I am? And I freaking I was like, smashed his face. So, anyways, a few minutes later after I did that, a guy, a kid, works in the store, younger guy, you know, 19, 20, 20, 21 years old. He comes run, I'm in the mall in the food court, like about to order food. And a dude runs up on me and he says, hey, man, listen, you might want to beat it, man. It's skedaddle because uh, that dude's trying to press charges on you. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, he freaking... They like, call the cops. So they got my manager to call the cops, and they're looking at camera footage and da da da. So like, they're looking for you. They're walking around the mall. The cops with the kid looking for you. And I'm like, I'm out of here, bro. Thanks, man. Dapped them up. It's gone. And so uh, now, fast forward again. So so, but that that wasn't the kid with me who went to Chicago. So that wasn't the same dude, the, the handsome kid, but Tony was there. So, but this is the stuff that this dude, Tony had seen me do or hear about me. Oh, and by the way, that's another funny part. I just remembered part of that story. The day after I smashed that dude's face in, in, off the freaking uh, thing in a, in a mall, I go to this Regina party, which is an all girls school. It's an all girls school, a bunch of whores, a bunch of slutty, like Lucy's uh, and Catholic school. And I walk into the bait because I walk in, the party's kind of stir girl kind of party. They all knew me. I walk in there and somebody's like, yo, your boy Gino's in the basement. You know, he's down there playing poker. So I come walking in the basement and Gino's sitting at the table with like six of these Lakeview dudes, right? 
and two of them, it's, it's the two dudes from the night before, the, the day before I smashed. It's one dude, the dude who wanted to press charge, him and his boy, and like five other ones. And they're all sitting at the table. And Gino, and I'll never forget that day because I took some Vicodins. And I, I remember it was like one of the first time I ever took Vicodins. And Gino said to me, What's up, Al? He's like, I said, What's up, man? Sit down, play some poker. I said, like, Nah, I'm good, bro. I don't play some poker. I'm just going to take this motherfucker's money. I'll just take it if I want it. That's what I said. I'll just take their money. I ain't going to play them for it. I'll just take it. And they all look at these six thank you dudes kind of looking at me. But the, the other two dudes who know me, they're just like, Oh, no, I'm not this freaking guy. The other dude's like, Who the frick is this guy? What are you talking about? He's going to take our money. And Gino says, What's up, man? He's kind of laughing. He gets up. He's like, What's up with you, man? I said, man, I just took some pills. He says, what kind of pills? I said, invincible pills. <laughs> That's what I said. I just took some invincible pills. I said, I think I could run through that wall right now. And he's, he's like laughing. But I didn't even know what Vicodins were. I just know when I took them, I liked them. They were awesome. And that's how I got addicted to Vicodins. But just anyways, to go back to back in Chicago, when I'm in Chicago with this dude Tony I spend the night but that night we go out to the club that's what I'm saying he says hey man you want to go out to the club with me and my boys I said yeah no, I'm down let's go to the club because I knew but by this point I knew he wasn't trying to freaking like kill me or have me get jumped or you know you know whatever so I'm like we're cool so um we go to some nightclub in Chicago I don't no idea what the name of it was well you know it just looked like a nightclub that runs back in Detroit exactly the same Girls, music, lights flashing, but loud pounding. Everybody's dressed up. I didn't. I didn't really think because part of me thought like the guy's like, well, we're, we're gonna drive, we're gonna pick you up. And I'm like, no, we'll meet you there. I'm like, well, you're gonna drive the van because all we had is the mute and the, the van, the, the tube van. He had boys in Chicago, you know. I said, all right, you pick me up. But part of me was like, man, this guy, this might be the setup. Like, this is the play. Like. Now they're gonna get me off guard and freaking, you know. But when he showed up with his boy, he's wearing a white polo sweater. And I'm like, eh, they're gonna freaking do a jump move. They're probably not gonna wear a white polo sweater. He's wearing like khaki pants and a polo sweater. And so I was wearing Nautica jeans and a Nautica uh, uh, sweatshirt. Like a blue Nautica sweatshirt and jeans. Might have been black, I can't remember. Black, black. I actually think I was wearing black Nautica jeans and a blue, dark blue Nautica sweatshirt. And uh, uh, Travis was wearing something green. I think he was wearing a, wearing a green sweatshirt or green shirt, like a Izod type of shirt, polo or something. Anyways, we go to this club. We're hanging out with these guys. There's about six or seven of them. So I was a little nervous, but they, I could tell they were soft. They weren't like, I don't know. They, I, I could tell they, they weren't soft. Like I, when I lived in New York, man, I met a lot of like wannabes who were like, would get Omerta tattooed on their chest and act. They would like bark about their mob connections and who their uncles were and, and they were always talking mob stuff and gang stuff. And they were all pussies, man. Like I'd seen them get in arguments with dudes or fights where they'd push and shove, push and shove, I'll kill you, but no I'm talking you talk, no, no, no. They would never throw a punch, man. Like I, I worked as a bouncer for like a year and I don't think I seen one of them throw a punch. I knocked out a couple guys while I was there. And they that then that's when they all thought I was some kind of legend, you know, because I they some guys started barking, bam! I just freaking knocked them out. And they're like, holy crap, dude. That dude from Detroit, Al, ain't no joke. I'm like, man, bro, listen, somebody's barking in your face, drunk, talking. I mean, what the f you, are you waiting for him to hit you? I'm not, I don't want to get my freaking teeth knocked out or my nose broken or eye socket shattered or whatever. Guy barks, that's it. You paid a price, man. You barked. You thought you were tough or you wanted to pretend you're tough. You, I'm calling your bluff. Wham! That's it. Boom. But the, the Chicago guys end up getting in a, a fight. Uh... It was a pushing match. It wasn't like a real fight. But so there's like four or five guys and they're hitting on these girls. The, you know, the, the Chicago guys are hitting on these girls. I do remember there was two, two of them were black girls and they're really good looking. And the, and then the other girls, they were looking to or whatever. And so these Chicago guys are hitting on them. And there were, I guess there were some other, I think, I think what it was, was one of the girls boyfriends was there. So these, so these rando Chicago dudes that I was down there with got into a confrontation with these, this one of the girls' boyfriends, and then there's, but that guy had boys there too. So there was five or six. So the next thing you know, it's a full blown pushing and shoving match, and I felt obligated to jump in and get involved because I was down there. I went down there with them. Like, you know, it was four or five hour drive to Chicago with these guys in the truck the whole way. We're bonding. We're cool now. We're out at the club together. Now they're getting in a fight. I got to jump in. So I, 
I, I don't wait. I don't hesitate to nothing. Like, as soon as it's gonna, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. I jump and wham! I, I push a couple mother efforts. I said, look, the head knocked out. You know, I'm, I'm backing him up. Like, what you gonna do? Just do something. Shut the frick up, blah blah blah. And he's like, oh my girl, I don't give a crap about your girl, bro. F that bitch. And then after you do, and blah blah blah. blah. And they, I kind of, def I deflate it because I'm really aggressive. So I get in the middle of the mix. I'm just, oh, and I deflate it, and it ends like that. Right? But the bouncers ask us to leave. So. As we're leaving, we're walking out, and some here comes these two black dudes. You know, there's a line to get in, so there's like 10, 12, 15 people in line waiting to get in. And like these two black dudes kind of go to cut the line to get in. And Travis, the carny kid with me, says, Hey, mother effers, who the F do you think you mother effers are? There's 15 people in line, get to the back of the line, mother effer. And the guy says, who are you talking to, white boy, ba 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 ba. And Travis says, I'm talking to you, N-word, because the dude went there. He says, man, who the frick you think you're talking to? And the guy pulls a gun. And he pulls the gun, and he aims it at Travis, at point blank, just like this. Who the F you think you're talking to, white boy? And he says, I'm talking to you, N-word. And the guy pulls the gun, and Travis, dude, that, that's what it was. Travis, I think, was ex-military. I think that he got kicked out of the Marines. If I remember correctly, I think he was in the Marines. He got kicked out. But anyways, this mother had for had some, some, some like some military special forces type of instinct kick in. Cause when the guy pulled the gun, he, dude, he didn't hesitate. He didn't miss me. Like I say, real recognize real. I saw something real in that mother effort from the day he walked in there. And that's why I got him a job, got him a place to stay, all that. And like when that dude pulled the gun and stuff, I, 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 you know, everything's happening in kind of a s slow motion. I have a 380 in my pocket, right? So right away, I slip my hand in my pocket and it's like, man, if things go bad and this guy starts shooting at all of us, you know, I'm gonna shoot back and defend myself. I'm gonna duck behind that car, bang, bang, bang. I'm already, in my mind, I'm already I'm already planning, do I go for a headshot? Do I go for a chest shot? You know, headshot's an instant kill. I only got a 380. If you hit him in the chest, it ain't gonna be instant. He'll be able to get three, four, five more shots off before he kind of, you know, is out of incapacitated. Headshot, he's done, but you know, if it's easy to miss the headshot. So, and this is all going through my mind. This is how insane I was and how insane my mind worked. As this mother effer's got a gun on my homeboy, five feet from me, I got my hand in my pocket. I'm going headshot, chest shot, headshot, chest shot. Where do I go? Duck behind that car, aim, make sure you aim, line up the sights. I'm thinking to myself, make sure you line up the sights. You got to line up the front bead and the sights. You just don't aim and point and never hit nothing. Because my dad's a gun dealer. I grew up shooting. I'm, you know, we, shot, we spent massive amounts of time shooting hundreds of thousands of rounds. My dad would buy army, army surplus rounds and he taught me to shoot. And, and anyways, Travis, like in one motion goes and he grabs the gun with two hands up with two and he starts twisting it and the guy pulls the trigger it's a revolver I get a 357 revolver and the gun goes off and shoots him dead in the hand bro and the bullet comes out down here it's in anyways Travis gets the gun away like shoves the guy up against the wall and starts pistol whipping him just smashing him the guy goes down. He hits him a couple times. Bang, the guy goes down. And he starts pistol whipping him. Boom, boom. And he's smashing the dude. Like ripping his face open with this gun. And the black dude's friend's going, all right, man, back up. And he freaking Travis turns around, points the gun. Mother well, after I blow your head off, bitch, back up. And I'm just like, whoa, I'll go, Trav. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Ain't worth it. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Take the gun, let's go. And we all dip out of there. And of course, we go back to the car. And the Chicago guys are going, holy crap, man. This freaking Detroit dude's a lunatic, man. And uh, and so I said, Travis, man, you got to go to the hospital, bro. You, you, you got you to gotta go to the hospital. You can't just freaking. And he's like, no, I'm good. I'm like, bro, are you serious? He had a bullet, a 357 went in your palm. And, and like it started to come out here, but like ripped its way out all the way to here. This big open like gap. It wasn't bleeding though. It, it not a lot. It was like cauterized because the bullet. I mean, the bullet was hot bullet, and it like cauterized it. So he was barely bleeding. And he said he's doing this. He's like, eh, you know, no damage, bro. There's no nerve damage. You know, it's sore. It's swollen and it hurts. But it just you know everything works. It's, you know, it's good. I'm good. I'll tape it up. Put some bad aids on it. We're good. I said, this mother effer here is the coldest, this mother effer is the coldest gangster mother I've ever met. This carny dude. This dude is a straight carny. 
Uh, I don't even remember whatever happened to that dude. I, I think he quit the gym, got a job somewhere else. Uh, I do remember going over to his house one last time and, uh, well, okay. Two last times. One time I went over to his house and he was getting high. He was doing Coke and I was like, eh, it ain't my thing. I don't like around, be around Coke heads. Cause if they do Coke, they'll probably do crack. And if they do crack, they're out of control. But another time I went to his house, knocked on the door and it was like, I hear music. So I just opened the door and walked in and there was a bunch of money sitting on the counter. And, uh, and I thought about taking it, but I didn't, I was like, you know, it's like 500 bucks or something like that. And I was like, 500 bucks. You ain't going to know. He wasn't there. There's nobody there at his apartment. I'm like, I just take this and leave. You know, was, you know, that's the kind of scumbag I was. But, but I thought to myself, this dude is a hardworking dude. Like he probably, that's probably his whole paycheck. He probably worked his ass off. He probably ran to the store to get a pack of cigarettes or something. He got to come home, find his money gone and just, nah, man, I can't do it. And I left it. I don't think I ever saw him again, ever. He could be dead. If he was alive, I'd be shocked. I'd be shocked if that dude's alive. I mean, but maybe not, man. He's one of those dudes that's super, like, tough and resilient and, like, you know, can survive anything. He's like a cockroach after a freaking nuclear blast. This type of dude just survives. But I wouldn't be surprised if somebody killed him or he killed somebody. He's in prison. But anyways, he was a good dude. Hope you enjoyed that story. Uh, just a, just a funny story. I had to run to town, so it's... Nice long story for you. Hope you enjoyed. It's kind of three, four stories blending together, but they all uh, they all add up. I'm just saying uh, there'll be some inevitably some mob groupie, group, geeky mother ever. I don't believe in these mother crap. There's no way he did that. These mother just making it up. Like, get out more, man. Just get just get out, man. Get off YouTube. Get outside. Go, go live your life, man. Go, go get, get in a fight. Even if you get your ass whooped, go fight, man. Like experience what men do. They get punched in the face. Go punch someone in the face. Stop pecking on a keyboard, man. Just saying. All right, I'm out, man. I'm gonna. Go. I'm about to power wash this car, man. The former prisoner and inmate. <laughs> he said, uh, "What are you doing, gun?" Wanna see you with your hands up? <laughs> Going straight to the sky, let me see you put your hands up. Cause we do till we die and we on another level. Yeah, I'm at New York City. <laughs> Got a piece of the pie, told you once. Told you twice that we only got one life. On the way to achieve success after prison, he's gonna share his story with us right now.